Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and um, Bill Kuick is on today and we're going to do another program on growing uh, specific vegetables and fruits and we're going to be doing things uh, that you can start eating in the spring today. Thanks for coming on again, Bill. Hey, thanks for having me again. Uh, yeah, and of course we're all going to use like organic uh, principles and uh, what we're uh, uh, what we're going to do. Uh, I'm sure all of you viewers <laughs> viewers are going to do that, right? <laughs> At least we hope so. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, to me, I mean, I, I know you can use chemicals and stuff, but it, 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 I don't know, to me, it just seems like so simple. I mean, you just use a lot of compost and, uh, and that's the thing. I, I mean, I know you asked about like doing some, some spring uh, vegetables and uh, um, what I do when I, I plant asparagus beds, do you have asparagus beds? We have asparagus at our house, okay. yes. Okay, you planted it? Carl planted it. Yeah. Yeah, he's the one with the green thumb in the family. I see, I see. Well, um, typically what I do is I either hand dig or I have, a, I have a, a, an attachment on my rototiller that will dig a furrow, so I'll dig a, a, a pretty deep ditch. And if I'm going to do a, a lot of them, I'll just fill the ditch in like with maybe, I don't know, six, eight inches of compost. And then um, I was going to say, I know you, you, get your, uh, you can get crowns, basically. I mean, you can start from seed, but it takes, I think, an extra year or two and even if you start from a crown, an asparagus crown, which it looks like a big spider, it's it's. A, well, you can't really harvest the first the year you plant, right? You, they they some people say you can harvest a little bit. I I go by like I don't think you should harvest for the first three. It should be your third season. The th oh, um, the third right, uh, and like I, three years after you plant right the asparagus. But I, the one the one way I have read and and this does make sense to me too. But the first year you don't touch it all. The second year you could pick for about a week, but you don't want to pick too much because essentially what the asparagus is, that's a spear, and of course you have plants, you know eventually they, they turn into about a six foot tall fern, uh, well, you essentially. You know what they, what they look a lot like, um, if, you don't, if you don't keep, uh, keep them, they're the certain ones, um, they wind up looking like a huge uh, dillweed Right, plant. I know people have been coming to my house like, you grow all that dill? <laughs> <It's not laughs> dill, but but what happens is is you have to let some of it grow up because when it grows during the the season, mm -hmm. um, it it that's what feeds the root, and the root is what mm -hmm. gives the it gives it the energy to put out the shoots, puts out the uh, the asparagus the next year. So if you overpick it, then you don't have any energy to to create a crop for the next year. So, uh, so, so typically, what I've read is the first year you don't touch it. Uh -huh. Second year, pick for about a week. The third year, you can pick for about two, two weeks. But then after the third year, you can pick for about a month. And I don't know about you, but I, well, you're you're a, you're in a slightly different climate than uh, me. But we usually <coughs> stop harvesting our asparagus around the middle of June, actually. Yeah. So you're a little bit later than me. I always think for me, I start getting it in early May. Sometimes it's even late April. The first first ones come up. But I always feel for me, and it, of course it depends on the season these days too, but usually the peak is like the week of like around the 21st of May, and then I, I go into the beginning of June, but I'm, I'm usually mm -hmm. done by, uh, by about the middle, mm -hmm. of, middle of June. But mm -hmm. anyway, I take the crowns, and, and uh, I mean there's different places that you can get the, the crowns from uh, locally, uh, Turnbull's Nursery, which is in, um, I think that's considered Brant. Um, but, uh, Actually, I, I was going to mention uh, Miller Nurseries too, which uh, they were brought up, bought up by Stark Brothers, but uh, they used to be in Canandaigua, but I think they have several places now. Oh, um, oh I, I don't see. know where else uh, to get them. I think I think you'd probably get them through like Johnny Selected Seeds, uh, possibly uh, Fedco Seeds too. But uh, but they're available. But it just looks like a big spider. Basically, it's a huge thing with all these roots, and there's just like a little clump in the center. And you kind of open that up. They they come in bundles, so they're all all the roots are kind of straighten you open those up and um, you know if you if you don't have a lot of compost uh, you can just take like a shovel full of compost put it in that trench or like I said I dig a trench and fill the trench with compost but uh, what they say to do is drape the um, roots over that so that they're sitting right on top of all that compost and then just cover there's different methods but uh, the thing that I found the best is if you just cover the, the crown with about an inch of soil then you, it's still in a trench, so you know it's going to get plenty of water and all. Uh, but um, as it grows, you want to keep them clean too, because they're not really good competitors against weeds. 
So uh, once they start to grow, like let's say it comes up a couple inches, you go through there with your hoe or your rake, and from both sides you bring some of the, the soil back on top of it. So maybe it's planted in an inch deep, so then maybe a month or so later you bring more soil around, so then it goes oh, another inch. Oh, so, edge. You, so you gradually add it yeah, you as gradually, it grows. You gradually hill it up. So I mean your, your root, your, your <laughs> crown could be a good six or seven inches below the soil, and um, I learned this uh, from uh, this next thing. I know you, you said uh, you wanted to do strawberries, because uh, and that, that and really all all the berries are really uh, spring is a good time to plant those. But uh, I feel like with with the uh, asparagus and strawberries, May is a is a good month to plant, or uh, you know later April. Once it starts getting hotter into into June and July, uh, it's it's not good to plant mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But um, after I hill, probably at least once a month if not more often during that first season um you know you they're thin and you don't really get a, a whole lot of uh growth that that first year until they establish but then the next season just about the time that they would start to to grow uh in between each asparagus plant and usually 18 inches on centers is where i i, I plant the asparagus so 18 inches on center but then between every asparagus plant i'll plant a strawberry plant um, between each one so you can actually grow both uh, in the same area and get kind of a double crop and not have to have your asparagus bed and your strawberry bed uh, separately and one thing um, I always like to tell people when uh, they're starting their strawberries is I know everybody's all excited that first year they want to get their first strawberry but uh, it actually weakens the plant if, if you pick the strawberry if, if you let it fruit the first year so I will actually oh. go through on my hands and knees and pluck out all of the flowers the first year. And you know, occasionally if you miss one and a fruit starts, I, I pinch that up because what you're trying to do your first year is build a plant. You're trying to oh. build a solid, you know, healthy plant. So if you do that and get a nice sized plant your first year, the next year you could literally harvest a pound per plant. And then of course, after the first year, they start to shoot out runners, so your whole asparagus bed is going to be covered with um, oh, yeah. with with strawberries. Now but. I have a question about planting them uh, the strawberries between each. Now did you mean between the plants in the row or between the rows? No, oh, between the plants in the row. Like like if, if oh, this okay. were this were our, our bed of uh, of asparagus, our trench went down the middle, we plant the asparagus uh, this way, then the strawberries are interspersed between. Oh, okay. But eventually, okay. like I said, it'll it'll be everywhere. And the other thing I, I do want to say too, though, after the the hillings, I like to put mulch. And and I know some people get really like I, I know straw is supposed to be weed free. It's supposed to be seed free. But uh, oftentimes there is straw that we get around my part of the county that comes from Niagara County. And I don't know why, it's supposed to be wheat straw, but I, I actually used a little bit of it for my garlic this year, and um, there's a lot of wheat seeds in it. So they're oh. not like weed seeds, but I mean, now I've got wheat growing in my garlic because I use that. But um, I will often get old like mulch hay from a, from a farmer that if the, if the hay got wet before the harvest, um, he'll, he'll um, bale it up but then he sells it cheaper as, as oh, mulch hay because it's not good for feed because oh, it has okay. mold in it and stuff. But to me, I'll use that and I'll just take like a whole flake of hay. So if this is my, my bed where I've, I've raked the, the soil up over the, uh, the asparagus, um, I'll actually just layer that um, um, straw or hay, I mean, on the sides of that to keep it moist because asparagus needs consistent uh, moisture. So I mulch it that way. But before the season's over, too, at the end of the first season, I'll put a nice thick layer of about four inches of compost right on top of that bed, too. So that's what my strawberries are going to go into. And the reason that you can do that is, like I said, your asparagus crowns are probably, the, so the roots are like seven inches or so. It could be eight inches below the soil, maybe even more below the top of the soil level. And as you probably know, strawberries have very shallow root systems, mm -hmm. so they don't compete mm -hmm. for the same uh, nutrient sources. And, uh, and then again, you know, you're going to put straw around your strawberries to help to, to mulch those. And then, you know, typically, as, you were, as we were saying, usually you're harvesting, uh, for me, I'm harvesting asparagus, you know, pretty much the month of May is where I usually figure in the peak uh, around the last week of May. And then, you know, strawberries start coming in in like middle to later June. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, a difference in the, uh, right, uh, the timing right. of the crop. But, uh, right. and, and if anybody has uh, any, any interest in my... Uh, uh, preferred strains. I, I do like the Miller's developed uh, something called Super Male, 
Um, for strawberries or for, asparagus? For the, for the asparagus. Oh, the asparagus. Uh, they say 600% uh, larger um, um, yield because the, it, it, you know how when you when you harvest asparagus, sometimes you get the real big fat ones and sometimes there's those little thinny, yeah, thin, spindly yeah, ones like that. The yeah. thin ones are actually the females and the bigger ones are the, are the males. So yeah. this is like pure pure males somehow and they, they do make really, really Yeah, big. it's like the skinny ones seem awfully tough. You sometimes know, like, they can be. Like, yeah, they're, like they're not edible Yeah, or they're something. real fibrous. They yeah. can be. But I, I think sometimes too, it's like, we think they're going to get bigger, so we let them go a little bit too far, and then they, they, they get a little bit fibrous like that. My my favorite strawberry strain uh, developed for New York State is uh, Honey Eye. Uh, really, really sweet. They don't make a huge, huge berry, but I mean, I get I get you know good size um, berries out of them. But uh, Honey Eye developed for mm -hmm. Honey Eye New York. And, now, uh, I just this past summer, and I never knew it before. Um, I was seeing in various places around the Mayville area, you know, where people were selling strawberries all summer, and I'm going, right. The, uh, the, they were saying we're locally grown, and I said, I thought we could only get strawberries around here locally grown in the month of June, and then the people would tell me, oh, these are called ever-bearing. Yeah, yeah, the ever-bearing ones. Yeah, so, I mean, you don't, you, know, you, you uh, get a, I mean, the thing is, like, like with the, the June-bearing ones, you, you'll get, like, a big crop, like, toward, toward the end of June, uh -huh. and, you know, maybe maybe some for, for a few weeks and for about a month or something like that, but the ever-bearing ones, I mean, they do produce longer, but you'd have to have a lot, a lot of plants to get. Oh, is that right? Is I mean, that like right? Each plant might Be produce like one berry a was, week or something like that. Was because all, I'd, all season. I'd been seeing these, you know, in, in a certain couple of farm stands and this one right. grocery store that had them. And they, and this was like late, uh, late August, almost, right. almost Labor Day, you right. know, that I was seeing these. And, and they said, oh, those are ever, Right. Ever bearing strawberries. Right. So well, and and again too, you know, to get, if if you like the strawberries, you like well, we we mentioned blueberries uh, before the show too, uh, but you know, also a good time to plant in the in the spring, like the month of May. And the one thing I, I'm giving another plug to Turnbulls here, but um, in the month of April, they have a bare root uh, sale, so everything that they sell before they pot it up, so you can go there and get you know fruit trees, berry bushes, and and you know anything like that. Um, Early and if you go there before they pot it up, I mean, you could you could get like a plum tree for like fifteen dollars or something. Oh like that. yeah, I mean, really, really. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's more now. I haven't been uh, in a few years, but their their prices are fairly decent. And uh, and you know, if they if they take that tree and they pot it up, you know, maybe it's seventy dollars after they, after they pot it. But mm -hmm. uh, if you go there uh, in the springtime and you just you know take the stuff. Uh, before they, they pot it up, uh, you do get some uh, some good prices on stuff. But another thing, kind of going, like tying together the last talk we did, which was uh, we did like a lot on the cover cropping. I know right, we talked right. about garlic, but um, one thing I, I wanted to say too, you know, we're kind of talking about spring uh, growing, is that again, the peas, even, even if you have a small garden, if you could just even get like a five pound or even a couple pounds of peas, and instead of planting them for a, um, food crop just to plant them as a cover crop and it, it makes a really really excellent uh, cover crop and oftentimes for me um, I'll try to plant like peas and spinach right around the first day of spring I mean if if, if you can see the ground if you can yeah see the yeah if, if the snow is all gone right, by right, that time right. um, uh, I've always heard that uh, you should plant onions and peas early well, yeah, it depends. I, like with onions, I will start those indoors uh, if I'm starting from seed. But oftentimes, I actually buy plants from uh, well for uh, peas or onions. Onions. I onions. usually buy, buy onion plants from Texas. Uh, actually, it was that was from Georgia for a long time, but I switched to different different company. But uh, so I usually buy onion plants. Which one thing about that? I know a lot of people say they they grow their onions from sets, and uh, I had always heard uh, for a long time that onions grown from um, plants, you get a better plant and you get a better onion. But the thing is, is, I don't know if you know how they make sets, but late in the summer, they'll broadcast onion seed and then when they, they'll grow up and then they'll just go over them with the back of a rake and knock them down and then so you get a small onion. So you've mm -hmm. already, it's already grown one season mm -hmm. and then they're stored and then you're trying to plant that to grow another onion the next year. And you know, obviously it works. It, it does, uh, that's what people have done for many, many years. But 
when you think about it, that onion's already been stored for one year. So the next year you try to store it, it, it the storage is not as good oh. uh, as if you oh. go uh, go from a plant. But if you do start from seed, yeah, I, I would start uh, really, really early, like in February. And, and this is a little interesting note. There are There is in Johnny Selected Seed uh, a type of onion, and I, and I have done this. Uh, Bridger was one, and Olympic or Olympia, I think was the other name. Um, you can actually plant the onions in this climate. You plant those onions in late August, keep them weeded, keep them hoed uh, up until about like the end of October. And then I took PVC hoops and put it over the oh. bed. And then I just put a row cover in it, over it in October. Then we start getting more consistent colder weather <clears throat> towards the end of uh, November. And sometimes it's, it's around Thanksgiving. I'll, I'll drive like at the end of a, 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 a row of hoops with the row cover over it, which is sandbagged in. Mm -hmm. I will take uh, a clear piece of like greenhouse plastic, put two big metal stakes at the end, pull it really, really tight. I'll put a knot in the plastic so I can, I can put a rope around it and pull it super, super tight so uh, there's what I call tensegrity. So it's, it's tension over those hoops because if it wasn't tight and it got snow on it, it's going to fall down. So it's like a tent. You pull it really, really tight this way over the row of hoops. And then on the side, you put the sandbags in for the winter and uh, you cover it with clear plastic. And then I actually did find, I never read this anywhere, but I, I was thinking the one year, it's like, well, it's, it's October, leaves are down and stuff. So I started uh, mulching them with leaves and straw after they were, you know, well, well weeded. And, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the fall, I mean, they're, they're like, they're thin. They're, you know, probably an eighth of an inch at most. But, I mean, these uh, leaves on the, the onions could be, you know, what is that, like maybe a foot and a half long. So you come the next spring, like let's say in March, we start getting some warmer days, sunnier days. You, I would have a little stick and I would prop it up in one corner of the, uh, of, the, of the plastic and then over on the opposite corner. So there'd be some air movement through there. And you can actually, so you're growing these onions from the end of August all the way through the fall. They sit dormant all winter, and then the next spring, you um, just start opening up that tunnel. Eventually, you, you take the, 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 the plastic off, uh, the row cover off. And um, I used to sell grape crates full of green onions to, to restaurants, local restaurants in May uh, mm -hmm. from those. And you could actually harvest a bulb onion at the end of June into the beginning of July. They're not keepers, they're not gonna like keep all winter or anything like that, but mm -hmm. it's nice to have an actual bulb onion in the in the summertime. Yeah, so yeah. You know, you, they'd probably keep pretty good, you know, July and August and maybe into September and then your main season uh, onions would come in in, the, uh, in September. I wanna go back to the strawberries for one question. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, now, seriously, now say that you've had asparagus that comes up on its own again every year for right. several years. Right. Um, can you still plant? You could still do it. Yeah, you just gotta you, make sure it's fairly clean and just you know put put some compost down. Yeah. Okay. I okay. usually just do. I usually feel like well, if I plant the asparagus, you don't want to do it the same year because you're going to be doing all that hilling. So I usually fi figure at least a minimum of, of one season. And in fact, I planted strawberries the f the the year after I planted my asparagus, and I had you know really good strawberries for about five years. But then they were just getting a little bit weak, and they weren't like holding together the way I liked, and they, they weren't producing, and there was just it. it so I, I pulled them all a few few years ago uh, with the intention of replanting, and I haven't yet, but uh, I'm I'm planning on replanting this spring, so I'll mm -hmm. be ordering mm -hmm. some uh, some plants. Mm -hmm. But uh, another another couple things I also wanted to say. I mean, I know this is the time of year too. People start thinking about. Um, planting some things indoors too, and like we were saying, the onions oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, would be good. But I mean, you know, we're you know tomorrow. I mean, we're getting into you know the beginning of, of March, and uh, you know sometimes some some cooler weather stuff like um, even it, it, cilantro is actually super super cold hardy. I've actually gone out and picked uh, cilantro that was under six inches of snow before. Uh, but you know, lettuce is a good uh, good hardy uh, crop. But um, you know, peas, like I said, planting your your peas for for. Uh, um, you know, for a, a, an edible crop uh, in, in March is usually a good thing. And then uh, the, the cover crop, uh, like I said, also. But the one thing I, I often find, I hear people uh, doing this and saying this, but uh, 
uh, where they'll start their tomato plants like super, super early. I have one friend. Like that, February. Oh, oh, January. My one friend, oh, his, his friend's got a, a wood burning stove in his garage and he starts his plants in, in, in January. And it's like, you think about it, it's February, March, April. You don't get to plant them out until the end of May. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and actually, if, if you, and I always tell everybody, if you're ever looking for any growing information, like the Chinese Selected Seed uh, catalog is excellent. There's, there's a little green bar that gives you the, uh, the cultural um, uh, information on, on every, uh, um, every type of vegetable that, that there is. And uh, um, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll go to this if it's okay uh, real quickly for the, uh, the tomatoes because I really do believe this, that if you start them too early, uh, they get stunted. Mm-hmm. Uh, cultural growing, the first thing it says, don't start too early. Root-bound leggy plants have open flowers or fruit when planted. Planted out may remain stunted and produce poorly. Um, I, I've, I've actually bought plants at a greenhouse that were heirloom tomato plants, and the, the plants were probably almost two feet tall when I bought those. And then I had my plants that were, I usually start five weeks before Memorial Day, so I'll, I'll figure out when Memorial Day Oh, you Day plant is. them indoors? <laughs> Five right. weeks before right. I'll start, Day. Or if I want a, a hardier, stockier plant, I'll start eight weeks before, but almost instantly put those into four-inch pots. So I'll have a plant like maybe, I don't know, it's at four or five inches. But, I mean, the, the stalks are almost as big as my index finger. I mean, they're, they're thick, stocky plants like that. And I'll still even bury those deeper. And, and, and when I plant tomato plants, I always try to bury the stalk. A lot of times I'll actually, if, if, the, if the, the, the stem is long enough, I'll actually turn the, the, the root ball upside down so I'm putting the top of the root ball down into a, a deeper hole so the, the root is or the, the stem is actually doing something like this so there's only this much sticking out of the ground. And uh, like I said, when I, when I planted, comparing the plants that I got at the greenhouse that were you know two feet tall, mine were maybe three or four inches tall. Within two weeks, my plant surpassed the oh, was that and, right? And the yields were wow. were, were uh, much different too. So yeah, wow. roughly if you're going to keep them in the little little like one one by one the the cell packs like those four by fours, uh, four by four cells that there's four in each each uh, um, each four pack. Um, those you start about five weeks ahead of time. So you figure you know if Memorial Day is the end of end of. Uh, May, then sometime, you know, it's about about the 20th of June or 20th of April or something like that you'd plant. But then um, Some, sometimes you can even get a killing frost like in the first half of June even. Yeah, maybe we, where you live. I've, I've never seen a freeze in, in, in June. <laughs> we've, but I, we've, we've had some pretty heavy duty frosts oh, yeah. in June out yeah. where we are. Yeah. yeah. Now, for me, I know for a fact, like I, I on um, there, there's been more than one time that on like May 25th, May 26th, I've gone down to 25 and 26 degrees mm-hmm. um, that, that late May. I remember a more Memorial Day where it was the 26th, oh, yeah, yeah. 26th of May and, and I, I got a freeze uh, that morning. Oh, and, uh, yeah. I know it was funny. There was, a, there was a college girl that I was helping a few years back with, with uh, some gardening and stuff. And uh, uh, it, was, it was late April and uh, she sends me a text. She says, well, I checked the weather forecast and there it's because it's, it, it was a really warm day. She goes, it's supposed to be really warm. She goes, there's no chance of any freezing weather all the way till, till June. I said, well, I said, you know, you, you can do whatever you want to. But I said, seasoned growers around here know that you can get a freeze all the way until till the end of May. And uh, I don't know what she did, but I, I know after that really warm day, we might have had another like moderate day or two. And then uh, there was a week of really cold, rainy weather after. I mean, I'm not saying it was freezing weather, but like 40s and, and rain, uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe maybe your peas and spinach would, would do okay and something mm-hmm. like that, but mm-hmm. uh, your your warmer uh, weather crops are not going to uh, flourish uh, when, mm-hmm. it, when it's that cold. And I, I, I actually, when I was much younger, when I first moved back here, I, uh, I actually uh, had all these plants ready to go, and I remember I always think of our, our last, our average last frost down by uh, Fredonia on the lake is, is around like um, May 21st, May 20th, May 21st, something like that. I want to say, yeah, it was May 17th was the Saturday. We'd had a beautiful week of like 70s leading up to that. It was, I want to say, 85 degrees on that Saturday. And I'm like, you know, we're so close to the last frost date. I planted every 300 tomato plants, 300 pepper plants, eggplant. The next day it was 41 and drizzly rain. The entire week was like that. 
I put row cover, I put you know plastic up over the uh, over the peppers, put hoops up, put plastic up, didn't even mm -hmm. punch holes in it or anything. I figured, you know, they, they need as much heat mm -hmm. as they can possibly mm -hmm. get. And um, uh, that so that was on the Saturday, it was the seventeenth. The next Monday was Memorial Day, it was the twenty sixth, and it went down to twenty six degrees. I didn't actually completely lose any plants. But um, some of the tomatoes were, were damaged, and I, I did replace about 70 uh, of those plants uh, after that. So, um, and, and actually, if you, if you ever um, got seed from, um, oh, no, I can't think of the name. It was in, in Fredonia uh, for a while. Um, but anyway, their, their packets actually said for peppers in this area, oftentimes it's better to wait until the middle of June to plant when the weather is more uh, settled and, uh, and stable to uh, to plant those warmer weathered crops because mm -hmm. I mean you know you've got the cold lake um, and you know the cooler temperatures you don't really do them any good and I, and I think we might have mentioned this in another show I know um, one friend of mine one year wanted to plant her tomatoes she wanted early tomatoes so she planted on on May the 10th I said you know it's real early uh, to plant that that early and she's like oh well, I want early tomatoes and I remember on about June or May 21st I thought well she planted hers 11 days ago and I, I dug the holes I, I felt the soil, and it, it feels cold, like almost mm -hmm. like ice underneath the soil. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think this is a good idea to plant in there. So I just dug the holes and I left the holes open. I, it, we had four, three, four sunny days, three days of sun in a row, and it warmed up. So I backfilled the holes a little bit with the soil that had been out of them, and then I planted my, my plants shallowly in the top of that. So I planted two weeks later than she did, and when we flash forward to harvest, my tomatoes were ready two weeks before her. So even though she planted two weeks before me, her tomatoes were actually two, two weeks, weeks later, later than mine. Than, so, than so, yours. so a lot so, of times the... Yeah. Well, you know, one year, oh, this might have been like in the late 1980s or something like right. that. I'm thinking we had, we had some years where we were actually getting really warm weather really warm temperatures yeah. like in the 70s in the month of March right uh, some, ye some years some yeah. years uh, some years that happened and I re so I remember um, I remember Carl planted the peas and the onions then in in March in March and I uh, I ran into this uh, elderly man that we were friends with uh, while I was out running errands one day, and mm -hmm. I happened to mention it to him, and he goes, "Oh, you're not supposed to plant the peas until Good Friday." Mm -hmm. Now I'm not sure why that would be. You know, uh, he, that was what he believed. You're not supposed to plant That's the peas a different day. On, until I know it's different every year, but uh, it turned out that that was the most productive crop of peas we ever yep. had in the garden. Like we'd, we'd, cool. never had, uh, we'd never had, we'd never had, normally most years, right. you, uh, we w didn't get like enough peas to have to freeze some right. of them, you know, right. for winter use. Um, it, it, we actually had uh, huge amounts of peas that yeah. year. That was the best. Well, and in, in Fredonia, the, 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 uh, I, I'll, I'll just say I think it's mostly the, the Italian people. They, they plant on, on specific holidays. So uh, what I've always heard is you plant your peas on St. Patrick's Day, and then two days later on St. Joseph's Day, you plant your fava beans. And then I know they always plant their, uh, their garlic on Columbus Day. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why he why he thought it had to you had to wait till Good Friday because Good Friday could be in March. Right, sometimes it could be March sometimes or could be in late April. sometimes in March, Easter's in March. So And I, you know, uh, speaking of that too though, I did one year and then when I just to say too like when I plant peas, what all I usually do is uh, I, I rototill my soil. I go through with a regular, you know, uh, you know whatever that is like a 6-inch wide hoe blade and I will put compost in the trench and then uh, one thing I wanted to say about peas I don't know if you ever inoculate but uh, there is pea inoculant it's uh, there there's um, just uh, microbes that come in a bag it's all like sealed up they're usually fresh you should get them fresh every year I think I've used mine for two or three years afterwards but um, you so wet you wet the pea seed you like I'll have a let's say a bucket of peas I'll, I'll get them wet I'll drain them so there's no water in it, but they're they're damp, and then you sprinkle the inoculant on them, and then stir it around, and then I usually just hand broadcast down that trench. I'll just let it sort of drop them loosely into the trench, and then I just just cover them up. 
um, after that uh, with, with a little bit of soil and they grow into that nice compost. And, uh, but the inoculant actually, um, it helps produce nitrogen for the peas when they are not able to produce their own nitrogen yet, when they're really, really small. But it, it also prevents rotting in the oh, soil. So uh -huh. you know, if you're planting them in March, I mean, the soil could be cool and wet, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, germination isn't always uh, ideal and, and perfect at that time of year. Oh, okay. But now, this inoculant, is it sort of like probiotics or something? It is sort of like, a, yeah, for people, you're right, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I mean, a lot of times, too, I mean, the conventional farmers, they'll use like uh, captan, which is a a fungicide, uh, but you know, also carcinogenic. So, oh, oh, um, yeah, we don't want that yeah, in our I, food, I, do I we? I don't prefer that, <laughs> yeah, and uh, in my stuff. But, uh, um, but yeah, so I mean, you know, I, honestly, you know, there's a lot of early things that you can plant. Like I said, cilantro, and I know a lot of people like to get their their broccoli and stuff out uh, early, uh, cabbages and stuff like that. But the one thing about that is, is that um, if they go through colder weather. And it's the same thing with onions too. That's why I, uh, when you were saying about planting them, you know, super super early like that, if if an onion is grown indoors and then planted outdoors too early, and then we get cold weather, that could make them um, think that they've gone through winter. So a lot oh. of times you'll get a flower head oh, on the top, and they'll they'll, uh, uh, they'll they'll go to seed mm -hmm. that way. But same thing with with broccoli. You plant your broccoli too early, get it out too early. Even even temperatures like even if you get three or four days below fifty degrees, um, even like bok choy. I've had like bok choy. Uh, it, you know, it, the the broccoli will form a head about this big, and then it'll start to go to seed, and, then, oh. and they're really kind of bitter, and, and they're kind of fibrous that way too. Hmm. So um, yeah, you know, certain things, yes, but and, and then uh, too though, like you said, as far as like getting. Peas in early. I know the one one year. I almost think I don't know if it was '08. We had such an early early spring. I remember planting peas on around the seventh or eighth of March, and actually they were up by before the twenty first. So before the first day of spring, I already had you know peas uh, up uh, a little bit. Um, so um, you can you know possibly get them in earlier. I know like some of the bigger farmers I've talked to that. Sometimes would have peas early to me. They're like, yeah, as soon as you can see the ground, as soon as you can see the dirt, they like to, to get them in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Now, one thing that we like to do in the spring is go out in the woods and dig up something called ramps. Oh, yeah. The people, and I'm going to explain, explain something uh, because I know a lot of the local people call them leeks. Right around here, so I, I wanted to mention that so they know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you do that? Yeah, I, actually I uh, typically in the, the month of May will go out uh, looking for uh, wild uh, morel mushrooms and uh, sometimes when I don't find any wild morel mushrooms you see these clumps of the uh, the ramps out there and uh, and actually yeah, I, I've sold them to, to restaurants for like $15 a pound. Even wow, too. wow. Um, I like to clean them up uh, pretty nice if I just uh, find them like that. I just don't, Throw them in a dirty bucket. I mean, sometimes you can run a, across an area where there's acres oh, yeah, of the whole, them. Whole woods is yeah, full we of, went yeah. Uh, two years ago. Um, two years ago in early May, uh, we went for a walk in the woods on. Um, well, this is way out in the boonies, and it's apparently some um, property that the Watershed Conservancy mm. has. Okay. Um, uh, acquired near um, near the Mayville area between Mayville and Sherman, okay. uh, near right by by the gorge. It's right on, okay. on the gorge, and um, we went for a walk there the first Saturday in May two years ago. It was one of those days when it got into the 70s and mm -hmm. sunny. It was just a perfect weather day. Right. That, you know, the kind that's most enjoyable for right. us humans. Uh, not too hot, it's not cold, you know. And we went out there and uh, it's like a piece of property. They've got some trails on it. They've got the trails marked, you know, with blue, uh, coloring, yeah, you yeah. know, on trees and things so that you don't yeah. get lost. And it's a 22-acre piece of property. Mm. And 
I couldn't believe it. We got out there uh, to walk, and that en that entire 22 acres was completely carpeted with wow. ramps. Yeah. They were right at that point where the leaves were up yeah, all nice, nice and green and everything. Yeah, and so we had, I mean, we literally had to walk on them to take right. the walk. And then when we'd walk on them, it would uh, the cause smell. it would release the yeah. smell. It yeah. was. It, it was like uh, it was like uh, being in heaven or something. Oh, yeah. A lot of yeah. people don't like that smell, right. but right. to me, it's a nice spring-like oh, yeah. smell. Absolutely. You know, I yeah, really, so I really It's like just one it. of those things that you don't, you only get them in the springtime. Yeah, it's yeah. So good it's, for, you. It, for those of us that like the smell and the taste, it's it's like just a favorite thing, you know. Uh, well, you know, and another thing I wanted to mention as far as spring uh, starting mm -hmm. things, uh, mm -hmm. usually don't harvest in the spring, but typically. Uh, in the springtime, I also start uh, mushroom um, mm -hmm. logs and stuff like that too. So if anybody's, uh, you know, interested in, in starting with something like that, you can uh, actually buy uh, spawn from uh, Field and Forest Products or uh, fungi.com, fungi perfecti, and um, you know, I mean, especially if you had a tree fall in the in the winter or springtime, you can actually use the the fresh unrotted uh, tree to. Um, to uh, inoculate with uh, with mushrooms, and uh, I, I did well. I've done it in the past, but just like two springs ago and, and uh, last spring, and uh, I I had some really nice mushrooms this past. Um, it, it was funny. I, I literally harvested on January first, and then another few days later, I, I, I harvested something like fifteen pounds of, of oyster mushrooms. So something else to think about if uh, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about the spring. And I, and I, I just saw something. I, I can't remember what country it was in, oh, it was somewhere in the, in the Middle East, they were talking about how it's so hard for them to obtain like animal protein, so they're actually uh, raising a lot of oyster mushrooms uh, oh. there to, to oh. feed like this, this community, because oh. um, oh, yeah, mushrooms are yeah. loaded with protein. I mean, they're, they're very high oh, in protein, yeah, so uh, yeah. uh, especially for vegetarians, a good, <laughs> good source of protein. I guess um, that's why uh, um, uh, somebody told me that that's why people became cannibalistic at some point in time was hmm. because uh, they lived in areas where uh, there really wasn't much food or something. Like okay. That. Well, that's not a very good subject. They didn't, didn't know about that. <laughs> but uh, oh, now you brought this in. I'm assuming you wanted to. Well, uh, I mean, you know, I'm just just something that you know. Another another aspect of uh, of growing uh, organically is that I mean, I don't use any chemical sprays of, of any kind at all. But uh, yeah, this is uh, Arbico uh, Organics, and it's uh, uh, they're beneficial insects that 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 you can release. And I know. Uh, I've I've actually re released these little tiny uh, tiny wasps that will take care of any of the kind of caterpillar sort of things that get on your plants, like the the tomato hornworms, oh, the, uh, all those the, the things. cabbage the cabbage loopers and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, those um, tomato hornworms are really gross. I remember one year we had one summer we had them um, <coughs> on our uh, on our tomato plants, and I remember. They just happened to be that certain shade of green where, you, you know, they'd sit Oh, they on, look just like the plant. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you don't know it's there, and then you, you go to pick some tomatoes, and the next thing you know, uh, you squashed one of those, and you oh, got yeah. this slime all oh, over yeah. your, yeah, it's your hands, true. and it's... Yeah. <laughs> oh, they'll do... I mean, if you have a tomato plant that's a foot and a half tall, a big one will just defoliate a whole plant in a, in a day sometimes. Really? So I usually watch, like, if I, if I think I... If I notice some damage, on the tops of the plants, they'll usually be at the top of the plant in the evening, and then again in the morning. And uh, I'll I'll go through and just kind of watch. And eventually, you develop kind of an eye where they are a little bit of a different uh, uh, color than the um, mm -hmm. um, than the tomato plant. And you'll you'll pick them out. But uh, yeah, like like uh, ladybugs are great for aphids and and spider mites and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. I've released. Um, praying mantis. Uh, oh um, yeah. Uh, nest pods, and th those are good for. Um, uh, I mean, they, they reduce mosquito uh, populations too, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of beneficial insects. I mean, you know, you can actually work with nature instead of trying to fight it uh, to uh, to grow uh, certain things. But you know, typically, you know, too, I, I just, I mean, like I said, I, I mean, I use a lot of compost. I got, uh, uh, I think we showed at the last show where I had um, um, like three dump truck loads uh, delivered to my place uh, back in, I think it was early October. Uh, this last year, I'd, I'd run kind of low from. Uh, what I had had, uh, you know, somewhat in the recent uh, past, and uh, it, it, I, I like to add a little bit, you know, every time I grow. And, and to me, it's like I kind of follow what Elliot Coleman says: uh, for every 
30 inch wide bed, 10 feet long, I'll add a fresh bucket of compost that every time I plant. So if I'm gonna plant lettuce in the springtime, I'll put that, that amount of compost on it. Well, the lettuce is done in about maybe four or five weeks. And if I'm gonna put radishes in, I'll put another bucket in. And then if, when the radishes are done, if I'm gonna plant you know, squash or something like that, I'll do that again. I'll, I'll put you know, more compost on, mm -hmm. on top of that. So mm -hmm. every time I plant, they're getting a little bit um, you know, of, of fresh compost on everything. So that helps to you know, feed the soil and um, just um, uh, you know, give you the nutrients mm -hmm. that you need and condition mm -hmm. the soil too. Now, I've uh, quite often heard that uh, once your uh, spring crop of uh, radishes is finished, um, that you're supposed to be able to plant another one afterwards? You could. I wouldn't plant radishes again in the same spot because it's the same, same mm -hmm. family. Well, but. what I meant was it just never seemed like uh, planting radish seeds again in the... Uh, I don't, you know, on the same year. Um, oh yeah, I mean, if you planted if you planted radishes, let's say in, um, you know, early May. I mean, thirty days later in early June they're done. So I mean, you could plant tomatoes after your radishes, mm -hmm. really. But uh, you think uh, I, you think that might have been the problem planting radishes? In I the wouldn't. Same I place? wouldn't in the same place because it's just going to in, uh -huh. invite like more so, like pests and disease oh, and stuff. Oh, I see. So. Uh, okay, uh, in a different location in the garden. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. You can do successions. I mean, every every two weeks you could plant uh, radishes for a continuous crop. Yep. Okay, I just I just kind of wondered about that because uh, I like to rotate things. I don't like we, to plant anything in I the same family within a three year period. Yeah, we we never were able to get a second crop of radishes in the same oh. year. So huh. see, I planted I, them late. I planted them in like uh, early August and even early early September, and I've gotten a crop in you the could, fall. Really? Yeah, yeah you can plant them because you know thirty days. You know, typically some are twenty twenty eight days mm -hmm. uh, for a radish. So I mean, if you plant them in September, you should be able to harvest them before the beginning of mm -hmm. October. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you know, lots to think about. This is an exciting mm -hmm. time of year for us uh, gardeners, you know. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention uh, we've got um, 16 minutes left, so just to give you some uh, idea of uh, anything you wanted to definitely talk about yeah, before I mean, the end of the hour here. Right, I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, your, your cold weather stuff, I mean, a lot of your greens and stuff like that, uh, you, can, uh, you can plant, uh, you know, uh, early in the in the springtime and that they're they're hardy. You know, especially spinach. Spinach, and because a lot of people say to me, "You planted that already? You, don't you think it's going to get cold?" I'm like, "I'm expecting it to get cold, but uh, <laughs> I uh, those things are hardy." And and mm -hmm. peas too, and fava beans uh, also. And I, I think some people get confused too. I've mentioned to some of my clients that. I planted fava beans. Well, they think, well, Bill planted fava beans. They'll go out and plant green beans uh, early, and then of course oh, they don't. Oh, they, they need oh. warmer temperatures. Oh, they need, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, a uh, uh, warmer uh, climate uh, to deep, even just to germinate. They're not going to grow in, in cold weather. I mean, beans are a warm weather crop, and um, and and I, and I think you know, for a lot of people too, it 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 it. it because so so many people do not grow their own things, they don't really know what the seasons are. And people go to the grocery store. I mean, you can get um, you know beans year round. You can get green beans in, in February if you want to that are harvested other places. And I've noticed you know people come to the farmers market and they really have no idea what's in season. They they show up in in the beginning of June and they think that they can buy corn and. And, and green beans in June, and well, you have just no, planted no. those like yeah, a couple yeah. weeks uh, before. So you know, you really, I mean, corn is you know traditionally. I mean, sometimes you can get some in July, but t traditionally it's more so, like a, a August, August August crop. Yeah, right, right. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I think you know the way commercialism is and the way everything has has developed, uh, the way our uh, grocery stores are. I mean, you can get any, you know, you can probably get sweet corn in the in the middle of the winter from. Chile or something like that. Yeah, but, yeah, um, in the opposite hemisphere. Right, <laughs> right. Because they get summer when we get winter, right, and we right. get we get summer well, when sure. they I mean, get you winter. Know, the restaurants you know, they get so. asparagus year round too. You're but right, asparagus right. Asparagus is like we it, said. It's it just a, wherever from whatever part of the world it, where it's in season. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, we know too that when we harvest things fresh, there's obviously more. Um, nutrients right, in them right. and, uh, and I know myself I, I always tell people it's like if you've never and I'm sure you have if you have your own beds but if you have never picked a fresh asparagus 
like right off the plant and eating it right there. It, it's a completely different thing than asparagus that, that you can uh, That has buy. been shipped from way uh, far away. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right, yeah, from you know, South America or, well, or something Well, like one that, thing but. I know uh, from living with a garden uh, is that if you just pick something before you eat it and you're eating it raw, mm -hmm. you get so much energy from that mm -hmm. food. It's like, uh, it's like you can hardly believe that you feel that energetic, right, you know? Right. Um, well, yeah, and it's completely different, you know? I mean, I, I know too, it's like, I mean, even a tomato, I mean, you think like, well, I mean, a lot of people pick tomato and let it ripe, ripen on the counter or something mm -hmm. like that, but if it's vine ripe and you pick it outside in the sun and eat it, it's completely different than if and you it picked has, it. And it has an aroma that, oh, yeah. that uh, a very noticeable aroma that you do not smell on store-bought tomatoes no, no. in the winter, no, no. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, those aren't even really, I mean, they are tomatoes, but yeah, they're, they're not ripened in the way that ours are ripened out on the vine like that. So uh, yeah, completely, completely get different, different product. And if you ever notice, an animal will never eat a tomato that fell on the ground. They'll always eat your tomato off the plant mm -hmm. because uh, the, uh, the nutrients are, are there, mm -hmm. but... Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, one friend of mine, well, she's actually Ann Watkins, uh, the other coordinator for the Vegetarian Society of right. Chautauqua County, and um, we were talking about the kind of worms that get into your corn, that get into the cobs of corn, and she always says that those are the ones that she likes. Those are her favorite ears of, co of the corn because they're the best tasting they're ones, the right. ones that the... Yeah. She, she goes, they're not, those uh, worms aren't stupid. She goes, they know what, which ones well, are going to taste. Well, those are the ones the raccoons eat, too. They don't, <laughs> they don't eat them when they're, although I have, I have found that, my, oh, they're almost ready. And then one night you go out there and the raccoons <laughs> your, your, your corn, corn crop is gone. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Carl even hasn't even planted uh, corn the last couple of years. And we always had really good tasting corn from our garden, but he just hasn't planted it the last couple oh, just, of years. I, he not goes, because of a raccoon he, he goes, I, I just don't want to spend the whole summer fighting with a raccoon. Well, you know what I've done, and it actually has worked really, really well, is uh, you can go to like, uh, you know, any like sporting goods store, Walmart or something like that, and buy, uh, it's actually red fox urine. That red you would fox use, urine? And you spray it around, around you the... You spray it on the ground? Uh, I usually spray it under the leaves of the corn. Under um, the leaves uh, of, of the, the corn. corn. And uh, they, 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 they do not compete. I mean, they're, 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 they both compete for the same kind of food sources, so the raccoons oh, the stay away. Oh, the fat foxes and the raccoons? Right, they'll stay away from each other that way, yeah. Uh -huh. so, and that has worked incredibly well for me, so um, something to think about. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and then too, like when things start to warm up just a little bit more, I mean, you can plant your, your Swiss chard and your, uh, your beets uh, can go out. I know a lot of people, like my father actually was like kind of like lecturing me when I first moved back. He said, oh, he says, we used to plant our whole garden on Memorial Day and everything was fine. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, if you're a gardener, that's fine. But I mean, if you want to have things early, you have to start, you know, a little bit earlier. And I've actually um, planted... Um, um, like I said, you know, I mean, I, I planted beets in, in April and, and early May, and then, you know, then you're picking them. I, I've even had people like, you're, they were just little baby beets in June. It's like, well, they're full-size beets by, by uh, late June because, you know, they're about They grow a, really fast, Yeah, don't but they? if you have a 50, 50, 60-day season and you start them at the beginning of May, uh, and I, I've, I've put them in, in, uh, in late April, too, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. they have... Um, um, you know, flourished and done done really well. It just you know, the ground has to be a little bit warmer than than when you plant your peas and spinach mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and stuff like that. But um, my favorite time to eat beets is when they're little baby ones and the the greens are all still really you know pull them up and eat yeah. them with the greens. Oh yeah, that's yeah. when they taste the best. To yeah, me. I, and I do grow a, a, a couple of strains of uh, of baby beets too. But yeah. I like I like all of them. I mean, I, I like main season and uh, and and the the baby beets. But yeah, you're right. The baby ones with with the greens are are, uh, are really mm -hmm. nice. Uh, but yeah, and then there's you know there are different strains too where you can grow just small ones and they're they're real real young or real short season and uh, and early too. But uh, special just for eating that way. Right. Yeah, right. Especially yeah. Uh, I want to say. Um, is there something bird? I, I, it couldn't be bluebird since they're red. But uh, um, yeah, I, I can't think of the name of the strain. My very favorite beet, though, is uh, 
the uh, Lutz Greenleaf. Uh, it's big. Lutz big, big, Greenleaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. L U T Z. Z yeah, mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. Kind of been hard to get the seed, and sometimes the seed is not true to type. Uh, also, um, mm -hmm. so uh, um, you have to be be aware of that. I, I actually one year bought a pound of seed for thirty dollars from Fedco Seed, but I had to join a special club just to be able to order the seed, oh. so it cost me $100 to join the club, so oh. I essentially spent $130 on, on uh, beet seed. Oh. Huh. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so, and you know, carrots too, I mean, you can start, a lot of people think of carrots as a spring thing, but carrots really do need a little bit of warmer soil too to, uh, to mm -hmm. actually uh, um, germinate. They'll, they'll germinate really, really slow, and then other weeds will come up with them, so, um, it, it is better to wait mm -hmm. until it uh, warms up a little bit uh, more like that. But uh, like I said, cilantro is really hardy, will germinate in cold, cold temperatures, your peas, uh, your spinach. I often plant like lettuce uh, in March too, but I'll also plant lettuce inside earlier and then that'll develop more and then I'll plant it out mm -hmm. uh, later on so you get a little, you know, so you, the ones you plant out will eventually catch up to the ones that you plant it in and transplant it out and then you'll get like an overlap of, uh, of crop too. But um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then, you know, there's all the different, you know, types of lettuce or strains of lettuce. And, and your, your hardier lettuces too are like your, uh, your romaine is actually hardier and, uh, and like a bib lettuce is actually hardier uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to cold um, temperatures as well. They, they really, I mean, lettuce like 50s are, mm -hmm. is like, you know, mm -hmm. perfect, uh, perfect temperature mm -hmm. uh, for, mm -hmm. for lettuces. Um, but um, yeah, and then, you know, I, I, like back to the, the asparagus and, and strawberry thing, I mean, mm -hmm. you really, you know, if you keep those clean, uh, you know, well, well weeded, you don't have that much to do in the springtime. But again, you know, still good to, to re-mulch uh, everything um, just to keep the, um, um, you know, the weeds down and keep the moisture in. And then, of course, to keep the actual berries of the strawberries off the dirt, because if they start resting on the dirt, um, oftentimes they'll uh, they'll rot, you know, when they're when they're you the, know the plant, not the no the, the berry, the, the berry, berry itself. Yeah, they, you want to keep the berry up off of the dirt mm -hmm. and onto the um, um, uh, mm -hmm. the straw mm -hmm. that way. So um, yeah, uh, the wild strawberries, those little tiny wild ones, are kind of good if you can get them at the right moment. But it's been my experience, you know, you'll see some that are still green. Oh yeah. You come back a couple days later and they're completely gone. They don't even exist oh, yeah. anymore. Something's come through and eaten oh, yeah. them, you know. Well, they ripen quick too and they're those little tiny ones. Like yeah. they get a couple of hot days and they'll, they'll definitely uh, um, come. But, uh, but yeah, like I said to that, that honey eye strain, I mean, you know, the strawberries are, they're, they're, they're really kind of pointy shaped, you know, mm -hmm. very like heart shaped. But I mean, they'll get like decent sized strawberries. I do have some some pictures of just like grape crate fulls of, uh, of strawberries that I've grown uh, in the in the past. Now, and with the asparagus too, I mean, I, I have found for me, I've gotten, um, you know, in a week, I'll probably pick 15, 20 pounds. I have one one bed about, it's really about 43, 44 feet long um, that I, where I get my, um, where I have my asparagus. But you know, like you said, I mean, you, you, when it first starts in the spring, you get a little bit, but that, 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 you know, about the 21st of May or so is when you get the, the bigger, biggest crop. So, um. Yeah. Um, now, when we were first talking about what we were going to do with uh, this, today's episode, I kind of suggested rhubarb as being something that's a really early food, and you said right. that you don't care for it. Would you yeah. like to tell a viewing audience? Well, it's uh, the salicylic acid, I want to say, is, and a lot of people say, oh, no, it's in the leaves. It's I not thought in it the was stalk. oxalic acid. Or maybe that's it. Oxalic acid. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's definitely not healthy for you. And according to Bernard Jensen, who's a world-renowned food healer, um, it's, it's definitely in the leaves, but he said it's not as, there's not as much of it in the stalks, but he says it's in the stalks too. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and and that uh, can contribute towards kidney stones and so forth. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So it's, I don't know. Uh -huh. I was never a big fan of it, and when I heard it wasn't healthy, I just I was like, well, <laughs> you, it settles it for me. So, so gonna... you don't bother to grow right, it or, right. or sell it or anything. No, no, never um, did. I have some friends that do, and I know they produce like huge, huge plants. But uh, uh, and I know also good to you know uh, uh, supplement with. Um, um, uh, compost, lots of compost. So, 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I know we talked about that. I, I thought about looking it up to, to see like what uh, was recommended, but I, I've never really grown it. Uh, yeah. And I've never, I mean, my one friend uh, keeps telling me, I think he might have given me some crowns one year, and I, I don't think I even planted them. I left mm -hmm. them in the garage until they dehydrated, and I composted them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just thought I'd ask about that. Well, we're down to three minutes. Um, so yeah, uh, to, to to wrap it up, like I said, with the with the with the um, uh, asparagus, if you want to plant asparagus, you know, dig a trench, uh, put compost in, uh, and then get your crowns wherever you're going to get your crowns. And again, you can start from seed, but I want to say it's at least an extra year longer uh, from seed. And I don't know about yours, but mine actually have reseeded, and there the bed is got more than the plants in that I that I started with. But then mm -hmm. plant them shallowly, and then uh, keep hilling, you know, mm -hmm. as the uh, uh, the season goes on and then um, you know you should have and actually if you take good care of those beds I have read that uh, fi they can last for over 50 years actually. oh good, wow good asparagus one, bed. one planting of uh, asparagus can last for 50 years right right wow, that's you know if, you, if you, you know keep it weeded and, and you know keep it um, you know fertilized and stuff like that too yeah that'll help it and then um, you can plant the strawberries, right? Stra yeah, the next year. I usually wait one year till I till I do the the strawberries the next mm -hmm. season. So. Well, that's something for us to think about. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody has a good uh, um, go growing season this year. And uh, yeah. uh, if anybody has any questions, certainly I'm available for uh, uh, to answer any questions mm -hmm. anybody might have. Yeah, um, is Boston lettuce similar to bib lettuce? It is, yeah, that's Boston bib, yeah. It's, it's just oh, that's a variety of bib lettuce. Right, right. Oh, okay. And um, so um, you brought a book in. Was there anything? Oh, you no, I just thought, you know, I just talked about Elliot a little bit. I mean, he has the four-season harvest. I mean, he grows stuff year-round in those unheated uh, Is this tunnels. him? That's him, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I okay, so I actually I know you talked about him a whole bunch of times uh, on the program. Uh, now I actually get to see what he yeah, looks like. Yeah, I think like. he's yeah. he's he's. Oh, he's wasn't, wasn't wasn't he into mushroom growing too? Or who was no. the who was the guy? Stamets that, was the mushroom guy. Yeah. Who? Paul Stamets. Oh, Paul Stamets. Yeah, he's oh, okay. in Elliot's in Maine. I think he's still actively farming, and he's got to be. I want to say he's got to. I think he's twenty years older than me, so he must be about eighty-one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, it's funny, um, in the news recently, uh, there was a man that they talked about. Um, well, he was actually, inter I heard him interviewed on the radio, and then I, um, and then I found a newspaper article about him. It's a man that's 102 years old, and I, I don't remember what they said his name is, but uh, he's 102 years old, and he's just getting around to retiring mm. from what his regular line of work w wow. was, was as a surveyor. He's retiring now at the age of 102 and talking about all these plans he's, for these things he's going to do in his retirement wow. years, like building things for his great-grandchildren and everything, you know. Um, so people, if you take really good care of yourself, you can be, you can work until you're over a hundred and, uh, and then uh, enjoy a retirement following that. Well, I know the one lady in, in Okinawa, she was like 105 and she was still raising all of her own food and oh, still sure. like going to the farmer's markets oh, and oh, sure. stuff like that. And the people, they, they, she still didn't, she didn't even have gray hair and people, all, everybody <laughs> wanted to touch her hair because they thought that that would give them the, the longevity. And it, but uh -huh. but uh -huh. I do know that at one point, um, one of her like great, 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 great grandchildren, because Okinawa also has the greatest amount of fast food places per capita of any place in the world and they brought her like i don't know it was like a big mac and fries and a coke and she was like what is that and they're like it's a big mac and she's like what do you do with it there you they said you eat it she goes i'm not going to eat that no. and, and they said in her lifetime she has never ever had a sip of soda uh in, oh in no oh life. oh you might as well drink deadly poison really deadly poison and get it over with because over the years uh, that's what's going to happen. It's going to kill you eventually. Right. right. So. Well, the sugar, for one thing, is not good for you. That's that's. And the and the sugar. carbonation and, right. and and the acid. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, now we've used up all of our time, and uh, thank you for coming on again. And we're going to well, see you. you. Uh, yeah, in, we'll see you we're going to see you in a couple of weeks. Yes. 
on another episode. And um, I'll see the rest of you in the viewing audience on the next episode in a couple of weeks. It's going to be somebody from the Northern Chautauqua Canine Rescue.